Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to the Learn Partimento podcast. I am so thrilled today. My guest is Professor Johannes Menke, and he is a tremendous guest, a real expert on Partimento in Germany, France. Uh, and we are going to talk about Partimento, Thorough Base, um, so many new topics. He's written some new articles that are very exciting. And I just wanted to mention. I really enjoyed the last interview and I felt, oh, that was too short. That should have gone longer. This And having read more of your articles, I realized this guy knows a lot of stuff, especially about the topic that I'm interested in, in which is Partimento. And so, Professor Menke, uh, Professor Menke, welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here. And uh, so let's, let's really just get right into it and... Um, where we left off, we were talking about Thoroughbase last in the last interview. We talked about uh, Adolf Bernhard Marx. We talked about Siegfried Dean. And uh, first of all, tell me what's been up, uh, what new research have you been up to since the last time we talked? So in the meantime, I did not do so much research about German Thoroughbase because I concentrated, as you have seen in the preparation, on uh, French Baroque music which seems for me to be a topic uh, where we should uh, have a closer look to it. Great. That's wonderful. Um, I looked at your articles and you wrote some really beautiful articles. Let's begin there. And how should we frame this? Is France, have, does it have a unique identity to the 18th century and the, sixth, and the 17th century when it comes to perhaps the thorough base tradition, their own style? It seems like they were very influenced by Italy, but at some point they decided we need our own national identity for our music. And so I think that would be really interesting to talk about. I absolutely agree. Uh, uh, this is a, a topic where we have to talk about politics a little bit, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because it has a big influence on the uh, development of music and, and culture. So <clears throat> we all know the, the famous Sun King, Louis XIV, who uh, uh, entered his power in 1661. And maybe this date also for music history has a certain importance because from this time on, he tried to, to, to reduce the Italian influence and to develop a specific French culture. You can observe this in all arts and architecture as well as in theater and music. <laughs> and this exactly was the, 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 the big hour for uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully. Of course, ironically, he was an Italian. <laughs> he was born in Florence, but nevertheless... Lully was, was born in, in Italy. He was born in Italy. Oh, and, wow. And he came to, to France as a, 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 a boy, and then he, he changed a kind of his identity. He became a real Frenchman. Right. Maybe more French than the, the original <laughs> born. <laughs> well, um, could you also explain prior to that, what was the musical scene in France like? Were they heavily influenced by Italian music? And were they listening to... Who were the composers that they were really listening to in France at that time? So if we look in the 1660s, um, there is still the, the influence of uh, composers like Francesco Cavalli was very big. Or uh, if you look into the sacred, sacred music, uh, we have uh, Carissimi, Giacomo Carissimi, whose uh, pieces were widespread in, in, in France. And so if you look at the, the first celebrations in the life of uh, the Sun King, yeah, <laughs> uh, this was under the reign of, of Cardinal Mazarin. Uh, and at this time, uh, all the time, Italian music was played. But this, this situation changed completely after the 1660s. And uh, of course, this, uh, today 
we will not uh, judge this uh, politic uh, <laughs> very well. <laughs> but there, there was indeed a certain success, if you want, because they really established a French style and many, many French composers uh, became, uh, they, they get important uh, positions uh, in their country and they developed a specific French style with some <clears throat> specific harmonies, uh, genres, uh, certain kinds of counterpoint and so on and so on. And then later, this style had a big influence uh, in Europe. Okay, so when we talk about the and what year was this, Professor Menke? What year were, were we talking about that uh, that change? Well, the, the change in, uh, to to what's the French style? The French style, yeah. I think it's of course it's a development. You cannot mm. say this was the year exactly, <laughs> but it's always good to have a, a sim symbolic year. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take in sixty one in yep. the year where the Sun King. Right. Uh, uh, started his uh, powership. <clears throat> so, um, Couperon is a name that is is mentioned quite a bit, and uh, Corelli is is someone who was quite an influence in France. Um, you mentioned about something, some particular ways that they that they had different counterpoint, different ways of doing things. Can we get into that? So let's let's break that into some finer detail now. Yeah, if we talk about uh, François Couperin and Corelli, of course, we are a little bit later uh, because uh, Couperin was born in 1668. So when he was born, <clears throat> um, the, the Sun King was, was, was already in his power and Lully was uh, still alive. But later, when, when Couperin was working as a composer, Lully was dead and, and the Sun King was old. And this was a time where the, the influence of Italian music increased in, in, in France. There was a, a concert series uh, organized by uh, Abbé Mathieu. And in those concerts, uh, they were played the first time uh, the Corelli Sonatas in France. This was in wow. the 1690s. Okay. And, then, you know, in the 1690s, the, 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 the Italian uh, the, the Corelli Sonatas were quite fresh. Uh, <laughs> Because they were published in the 1680s and some of them, them uh, uh, even in the 1690s, so they were <clears throat> uh, performed in, in France, and uh, it, it, this had a big effect on the French composers. <laughs> okay. And the young François Couperin was absolutely fascinated by the, this uh, new music, and he, in one of his prefaces, he says, uh, uh, "I will love this music in all my life." <laughs> 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 and later. You know, uh, he, uh, François Couperin tried to bring together those different styles, the Italian style and the French styles. For some of his contemporaries, uh, there was a contradiction between the two styles. But François Couperin wanted to, to do it, to bring it together. <clears throat> yeah, let's talk about those styles. So we have Italian style, French style. People think of the uh, the Bach suites, the French suite, Italian suite. Uh, maybe that's not a good analogy, but because um, I've heard that actually some of those suites are, might not be accurate to the actual music itself. But can you explain for me and my audience, particularly about the style? When somebody says French style, what does that mean? Uh, it means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> if we talk about performance practice first, might be. Uh, we have many details of performance practice, like playing inegal instead of playing egal. So egal playing means I, I, I play the eight notes, da, 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 and inegal, da, 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 da. Yeah, this is oh. very famous, of course, in performance practice. Okay. The French uh, composers, they, 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 they used uh, different instruments, for example. <clears throat> uh, they uh, used some, some string in instruments we, we, which did not survive. So we, today we have to reconstruct them. Or on the other hand, uh, there was a certain development of uh, the wood instruments. So, for example, the oboe. And, uh, mm, the history of oboe France, of course, was an yeah. important uh, country. So we have many aspects of, of musical style. If we talk about composition and uh, if we concentrate on harmony, then we also find some uh, typical French harmonies, yeah? Uh, you will not find in the Italian music, and of, of course, also vice versa. 
some typical uh, use of courts, for example, the Neapolitan court, yeah, yeah. as the name says, this is a court really typical for Italian music. And uh, yeah, there are even some French treatises, uh, one of uh, um, uh, Marc-Antoine Charpentier, who, who um, talks about this court, and he says the, the Italian composers, they do use it, but we not. <laughs> <laughs> we use other things. <laughs> um Speaking of uh, harmony and counterpoint, I'm very interested in that. And so you're an expert on partimento. We know partimento is something that came out in through the basso continuo tradition, 17th century, Bernardo Pasquini, they say Roman or Neapolitan roots. How did that affect France? Uh, France has basso chiffre, is that right? How they say that? They have figured mm -hmm. bass. Is that how, is there partimento in France in some way, and in the 17th century into the 18th century? I think if we talk about Partimento, we always have to talk about institutions. Because we cannot separate Partimento from the famous conservatories. Right. Because in, in them, it was used as exercises for composition. We don't have those institutions in the rest of Europe. And therefore, we also ha don't have those collections of uh, thorough bay, th bay exercises called uh, partimenti uh, in Italy. Uh, but of course, we have the thorough bays. This was an international uh, issue. Right. And we also have uh, very important um, uh, treatises about Basso Coutinho. Let's take some earlier <clears throat> uh, by Niver or later by Dondrieu. And uh, not to forget that we find uh, the first complete demonstration of the famous rule of the octave in France. By a guitarist. By Campion. Yeah. Uh, he was the first. They called it the, the règle des octaves. Yeah. Mm. So does that mean, um, so, okay, so then we're talking about figured ba thorough bass then. Okay, so uh, what is the thorough bass tradition in France like? And I'm going to ask you about Germany as well, because I'm very interested in the German style of, you could say, partimento or thorough bass. Um, so what about France for thorough bass in the so 17th start, century? Yep. Yeah, exactly. We, we, have, to, <laughs> we have to go back. One, one century if you yeah. talk about that. Uh, so in the 17th century, uh, we have some sources for Basso Coutinho. That's clear, the similar situation as we find it in Italy here. And then we have this, for me, uh, important development uh, of the rule of the octave in 1716 by, Don, by, by, by Campion. And then the reactions, for example, Dondrieu, then also takes two years later, he also is, is using the rule of the octave. And then it, it, the development is very quick. If we consider that Jean-Philippe Rameau will publish his first treatise yes. in 1722, this is also uh, only some years later, and also in this very important book, uh, main, uh, many chapters, many, many pages are about Basso Continuo, about thorough bass. But what's, what Ramon wants to do is to give a reason for the thorough bass. Why are the codes how they are? So yes. for him, he also uses the rule of the octave, but for him, the rule of the, the, rule of the octave only is experience. And he wants to give a reason for this experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, the, well, now I think people are being aware of the composers of the Italian tradition, the 17th century. I had no idea about Leo and Durante. I had no idea these people existed five years ago. Um, people knew Corporando. Everybody seemed to know. He was, he's a very famous person. Are we finding French composers that have kind of disappeared and are resurface, resurfacing? Are there any French composers that are also should be re-evaluated? Uh, it depends where you are. <laughs> so uh, let's take a, a famous example first, uh, Francois Coubrin. If you go to France, this is a, a really important name. You, you can go to the into uh, every bookstore and, 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 and uh, buy uh, biographies by different authors. And uh, if you do the same thing in Germany, only some kilometers <laughs> away from it, you will find uh, no biography about the famous Francois Coupon. So there's right. a, a certain cultural gap 
Yeah. yeah. And the same is about uh, the, the French composers, uh, which are le uh, less known than Couperin. Uh, so let's take uh, an important person, Delalonde, for example. Yeah. He was called the, the Lully Latin. Yeah, the, the, the Latin Lully was famous for his church music. In his time, he was a big name, like uh, Pierre Boulez uh, later. Yeah. Uh, but if I guess if you if you uh, if you ask your your friends or your colleagues, uh, do you know some pieces by Delalonde? Uh, maybe some people will say, oh, no, not not so much. Right. But if you go to France, uh, some days ago, I, I've um, mm, there was a documentation of on Arte, the television uh, broadcasting company, and they there was a, a, a day in, in Versailles, and they have played some very nice pieces by Delalonde, for example. So yep. for them, it's it's nothing new. Stylistically, um, what's the difference before the rule of the octave? Um, what kind of style, what chords were they not using before or were they using harmonically? What was different? I would say the rule of the octave is a kind of, of summary of rules you also find before. So if, if you study the scores by Lully, and most of them were composed in the 1670s and 1680s, you could use the rule of the octave as a tool for an, uh, analyzing it or producing similar music. There even is a, a, a piece, the final piece of uh, Armit, for example. This is a piece based on an ascending scale. Basically, it's the rule of the octave. <laughs> uh, but no theorist <laughs> in Lully's lifetime has developed that theory. It, it, it came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the most important uh, uh, term is the change from the modality, the old eight modes, to the major minor tonality. Okay. Which took place a little bit before. We cannot give a pre precise date. We can say it's it's during the 1670s, 80s, and then in the end, we have the rule of the octave as a harmonic theory <laughs> for this new tonality. Um, I learned uh, about people like Heinrich Schutz. I learned about people of that. I didn't know who they were, and, and I realized, wow, these are very important musicians before Bach, because I think people's history, for most people, before Bach, it's kind of a, unless you're into early music, uh, before Bach is kind of a gray area. So now I'm kind of curious, who are the big keyboard composers of the 17th century in France? And Couperin was, was wonderful, but he kind of is also a little bit into the 18th century. Do we have, who are the very famous writers, composers for the keyboard? Yes, if you look on the keyboard, which means harpsichord music, yeah. Uh, François Couperin is uh, in the end of uh, a longer development before. We could say the, the origin maybe is uh, Jean Bonnier, uh, who was influenced also by Froberger, this um, South German composer uh, who went to France later. Uh, and Jean Bonnier is a kind of a grand seigneur of the French school. Then he had some pupils among them, uh, Louis Couperin, who was the uncle of uh, the famous François Couperin. Right. And then you have the big uh, uh, Jean, uh, Henri Danglebert, who was an harpsichord uh, player on uh, in the court, <clears throat> and so you can say this is a, the, are the the most important steps in this development. Uh, Jean Bonnier, Danglebert, uh, François Couperin, and then many many other composers around. Right, right. Can you clear something up for me? I'm wondering, did Francois Couperin know Bach at all? Or is that, is that kind of a, is nobody knows? Hmm. So it's, it's clear that Bach knew Couperin. <laughs> because <laughs> Bach has, has copied one, one, one piece by Couperin. Right. Uh, uh, but I'm not sure if Couperin knew Bach. So in the past, there was a, a legend, a myth. Yeah, yeah. That there was That's what I'm letter, asking about, yeah. Some letters between them, but this is only a myth. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not true, true. yeah. <laughs> it's not right. true. And we should not forget that um, Couperin was, was older than Bach. Yes. 
I think if I if I uh, calculate correctly, 17 years. So it was another generation. It was the same generation as Kunau, the predecessor uh, of Bach in Leipzig. And and he was very busy in France with his uh, duties and his jobs. And so I guess he was he was not so interested in some. German composers far away in the Protestant Leipzig city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, could be. Uh, mm. uh, we talked about the um, the eight modes going down. The church, are these we could consider them the church modes of the uh, the Catholic Church? Is that what they used? Um, and then actually, is it twelve or eight modes? What's what? Why is it? Some people say twelve, and why do some people say eight? Oh. I hope that you will not do this question. <laughs> <laughs> this is really complicated. So I, I, I try to simplify a little bit. We have the old eight modes. These are the classical modes from the Middle Ages. Right. Then we have uh, the new four modes by developed by Clarion, you know. Okay. Ionian, Aeolian mode. And to simplify a little bit, in the 17th century, there was a new system where they integrated the new modes and the transposition, okay. of, or the most common transpositions. And they they had for practice the new, let's say, Baroque eight modes. Very helpful for church music, for organ players, <clears throat> and you also can combine it with the plain chant. But for the modern uh, court music, for the dance movements, and so on, for operas, you don't need those eight modes. Right. And we can observe in, in uh, one author, only uh, uh, taking it uh, as an example, um, Niver, the French composer and organ player, uh, when he published his uh, counterpoint treatise in 1667, he used the old, uh, the, the classical Baroque eight modes. And then some years later, he published a treatise about uh, Basso Contino. And in this book, he, he used only major minor. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Um, let's talk about Satz model, and particularly with with uh, relation to the French Baroque style. Um, and so that's a very interesting thing. And so for people who don't know, for German speakers, is is Satz model is that schema theory? Um, basically, yes. Because a schema is something you don't invent, so you, you, it's, it's something preformed, and you can take it and change it a little bit. But it's it's a part of a common language, if you want. Okay. And maybe la language is a good uh, um, um, good uh, starting point for talking about the styles, because in another yeah. st uh, language, in French, you use different words than in Italian, <laughs> uh, and the same is uh, with the schemata. Okay, so um, maybe, yeah, let's get into that. So yeah. how, let's get into the French Baroque style then. I, I can, maybe we can start with an example. Okay. Uh, if I take a, a melody, it's a chromatic preparation of a cadence. You know, I, I, I only play the melody, and this is a stylistically open still. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, an Italian composer would have chosen those harmonies. And now I play it in a French version with a model, a schema, I, I have baptized as Armit because it uh, plays a prominent role in the opera Armit by Lully. So I hope you can you can feel the, the difference. <laughs> a li yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So uh, can yeah. you try and describe a little bit in words? It's difficult in words, but for for people mm -hmm. who are who are not getting it, uh, what 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 was key there that was different? Yeah. What I did is the following. I, I used first a certain sequence in which I combine. Uh, a minor chord on a fourth degree with a minor chord on a second degree. This is this one. And after that, I go to the fifth degree. I could go to the fifth. Right, right, right. This is very specific. You can find it 
everywhere in the 17th century French uh, music and almost nowhere <laughs> in Italian music. <laughs> There's a certain tension between those chords. You can, because one chord has a B flat, the other one has a B natural. And then I did something very strong. I went to a chord, which is called in French, the La Corde de la Quinte Superflue. It's a chord with an augmented fifth okay. combined with a ninth and a seventh, which sounds very dissonant. <laughs> uh, and this, this chord is so dissonant that I, I baptized it um, uh, cri, uh, and uh, uh, cri means uh, if I cry, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's such a loud sound and dissonant sound. It is um, just like preparation and uh, resolution. Do all those nines and sevens, do they all have to be prepared or is it more free in the French system? I would say in the 17th century, they still have to be prepared quite strictly. Okay. If you go to the keyboard music, you have some possibilities for free dissonance, uh, um, uh, use of dissonances, but those are more connected with performance practice on the keyboard or with uh, the ornaments uh, called right. agréments in France. So okay. the famous porte if I do, Something like that. Uh, this is, uh, if I come from the, the classical counterpoint tradition, uh, illegal dissonance <laughs> <laughs> resolving up. Uh, but I can use this as an ornament. And then it's a, a part of the performance practice, not a part of the sacred counterpoint. Did they use treatises there? And what were the big treatises in France? About what? About counterpoint? About, about, uh, about counterpoint. Uh, counterpoint, yeah. harmony. Yeah, there are uh, some treatises about counterpoint. I only will uh, choose maybe two of them for today. So we have one of the already mentioned Niver, uh, a counterpoint treatise, <clears throat> and uh, another one by Charles Masson, which was uh, published in 1699. And uh, I mentioned Charles Masson because uh, uh, this is one of the uh, few theorists, so that Rameau will... Uh, will cite later in his uh, uh, Traite de, uh, de, uh, de l'Harmonie. So obviously, if also for, for Rameau, uh, Masson was a kind of authority in France. Right, right. And was... was and both, uh, yeah, both, uh, only one thing, but both um, are based on two boys' counterpoint. So what you learn is two boys' counterpoint, and then later you can add more voices. And this is quite similar to the uh, Italian uh, a tradition, of course. Right. Um, I was thinking about um, Bach, and I think there's a lot of research now that's been published. Uh, people, are, uh, he it mentions, I think CPE talks about the fact that starting with four voices uh, in, in playing, I think in basso continuo, in, in thorough bass, do we know how French musicians were trained in the 17th century? Did they... Did they have that lineage of learning the keyboard first or singing? How was a, tr a French musician in the 17th century, how would they learn? Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely curious about knowing <laughs> that. <better. laughs> so maybe also here we have to distinguish certain traditions. Um, yep. uh, on one hand, we have the, the old uh, matrice. Matrices were, were schools on the churches, and they had a long tradition going back to the Middle Ages. Uh, all these uh, uh, famous Franco-Flemish composers, they yes. come from the, the Matrices. And this tradition was still alive. And, and still they learned to improvise the counterpoint, singing and playing organ and those things. And then came new developments, basso continuo, a monodic style from Italy, and then this was also part of the uh, of the music, uh, music education. I give you one example. Uh, the already mentioned Chambonnier, yeah, this uh, grand seigneur of the harpsichord music. He was a fantastic composer of harpsichord music. But uh, <clears throat> we have some sources saying that he was not able to play basso continuo. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe it's the old, it's both old generation and all oh, these new things. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so he would have been a composer. For him. Well, was that kind of like someone who plays at the organ uh, in a counterpoint style? Is that is that what it is? Yes, in a counterpoint style, exactly. Later, it was a, a common practice, and everyone. So if you read uh, the prefaces by Coubran, we can we can learn that everyone uh, knew to play a basso continuo and to transpose it, which ah, really is um, uh, yeah, yeah. a yeah yeah right right <laughs> okay so yes, and, well, go ahead please uh, and uh, if you look in the uh, into the organ pieces all these big collections by Lebeck Boivin or uh, also Coubran himself uh, they are kind of um, uh, yes, best of the kind of pieces they have improvised on the organ in that right. time. Yeah. Right. Right. So they Let, give us a certain picture. Mm. Let's talk about the, the Satz model. We know in schema theory, we know the printer, the Romanesca, and uh, Ro Professor Robert Yerdigan has innovated a lot of uh, interesting ones and ones that are now in common parlance. Uh, can, what can we speak about French Satz model? Are there any schema can you demonstrate some the schema or sorry the satz model that they would have used perhaps that would be interesting for people maybe studying partimento today or basso continuo yeah so for me indeed uh, uh bob gerding and schema theory is a, is a model because he has uh he has um mm, combined uh, schema theory and style which right. is quite important and was a model for me also to uh, to combine the French style with specific French schemata. And um, should should we talk about some of them or? Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's get into it. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, then I distinguish between single chords and chords progressions. So one example of such a single chord, which is very typical for a style, is for example this. Cri chord with the augmented uh, uh, fifth and the ninth and the seventh I have played right. before. I can play it before, uh, again, maybe. So if you hear this single chord, you are immediately now this has to be a French composer. And that's that's a dominant chord. Basically, it's a combination of a dominant chord with a different bass note. Okay. Because, uh, Speaking technically, uh, it's a. Uh, in my case, I've taken here an F in the bass. I'm in D minor. I'm playing a dominant chord uh, above this chord. Ah. If you want, it's a very short pedal point. <laughs> <laughs> Only one moment. Right, right. Mm. Uh, okay, yeah. Would you? Shall we get into a few more of them? I think those those would be very interesting. Yeah, maybe this is enough for as an example for a single chord. Uh, okay. Um, and if you go to the progressions, there are some moments uh, where, um, for example, six four chords are used. Maybe you know uh, in the Italian yes. uh, counterpoint tradition, the six four chord is a dissonant chord, and you have to prepare it all the time and so on. And in France, the use of the six four chord is a little bit more free. Right. For example. Uh, I, I, I take uh, the 7-6 uh, progression. I assume yes. uh, many of uh, uh, people of our audience know <laughs> this uh, yeah. progression very well. If I play only two voices, I have this um, uh, thing. And the typical technique is to fill it with thirds with the bass. Yeah. And I have a 7-6, yeah? And what the French composers are doing very often, and we also find it in the theory, is they go from the third to the fourth, third, fourth, and then we hear all the time seven and six, four chord. And later even, uh, we can find it by in Rameau, then he fills this Six four chord with a third. <laughs> so <that's enough. laughs> 
and then it's only one step and you you, you arrive in the world of the bus fundamental because you yeah. can put under that the quintfile and this for me was really interesting that we find this technique even in some pieces by Lully. Right. He uses the progression and then some bars later he uses the same thing in the upper voices and in the bass voice he adds uh, a quintfile, a descending fifth. Okay, right. Now, fundamental bass is like a dirty word now it's become, but I, I think it's important to have always keep an open mind and always try to understand things, not have a knee-jerk reaction to things. I always try to figure out, and I am very interested in what scholars have to say. And w- when you say something like that, so was Lully thinking in that way? How, how do you think Lully was thinking when he would have done something like that? I think we always have to combine different tools. Yep. If you speak about composition technique, we never should uh, uh, search our redemption in only one system. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a time uh, when it was really important to emphasize the importance of Passo Continuo. And of course, it's clear for every composer in the Baroque time and in the 19th century, every composer had to learn Passo Continuo. And you can, it's impossible to understand harmony without knowing Passo Continuo. Right. Not. This is only the one one side of the truth. The other side is you have the counterpoint, and the counterpoint is a completely different approach. We will come back to that yeah. later when we talk about the Cadenza Doppia, I guess. Yeah. And the same as uh, with uh, uh, the Bass Fundamental. The word Rameau means if he uses the word Bass Fundamental is not the same which we mean if we used today the Roman numerals. Right. Rameau never has used Roman numerals. What Rameau wanted to emphasize is the fact that some things you play very directly in your right hand, they have their own laws, yeah, their own logic, and he wanted to show this with an own system, and he called that bas fundamental. Right. Maybe, maybe the word fundamental is more important than the word bas because it shows the fundamentals, the, the, the reasons, the, the rules of the progression. Basically, so, the resolution of the seventh into the sixth. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's uh, yeah, I, we're going to get into that, right? We're going to get into the cadenza doppia. Do we have more to talk about in the, the Satz model for the French Baroque style? Ah, right. We were talking about yep. the Satz model. Yes, we, I, I see you, you need more Satz model. <laughs> we cannot have... More, we cannot have, there's no such thing as too much Satz model. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will take a, uh, another one, uh, which I called CISO, uh, which is because of the contrary motion. Okay. So if you if you start on the root position chord. And you can see it's again a 6-4 chord. Here is one. Here, it's used in a quite uh, common way. So you can uh, give the typical uh, procedures of counterpoint uh, to explain it. But in some pieces, uh, by, especially by Francois Coubran, I also have found some uh, progressions where, and this sounds really <laughs> amazing, he uses some six, four chords after each other. So for example, oh, wow. things like that, It sounds quite crazy if you take it from the context. <laughs> <laughs> one one chord after the other. Yeah. But I've found so many examples that one day as I, I said to me to myself, uh, this is a standard, this is a progression yep. they use sometimes, and I've also found it in, in works by other composers. Um, and then I, I criticized it, Le Chat. This is uh, the cat. Because look, if a, a cat is moving always very carefully, mm-hmm. and the same is with such chords, you can only only use carefully if you use only six four chords. Right, right. Uh, for me, when I think of six four, I think of the compound cadence, and I think um, this that's that's interesting. Do, do you have anything to say about the compound cadence and what you've seen uh, in French music? Yeah. 
uh, should we talk about the cadenza doppia now? Let's jump into it. Yeah. So, so you wrote an article on the cadenza yeah. doppia, um, and I'm very interested to. So, in the parliamentary tradition, people recognize that as uh, five going to one with four stages. And so, let's let's dive into that now. Yes, and we will also find our way back to the French style, talking yeah. about the cadenza doppia. So, cadenza doppia is a case in which we can see that uh, Basso Contino can explain a lot, but not everything. <laughs> so, if you, if you look at the, Basso, uh, at the cadenza doppia, we find this information in, in, in all Italian treatises about partimenti. That this is the cadenza doppia. I will play a certain version with the seventh in the beginning. Uh, for example. Okay, and then one day I, I read um, uh, the treatise by Gasparini, and Gasparini talks about a cadenza, a composta maggiore. This is for him the doppia, because the term doppia comes later, and for right. him doppia is composta maggiore, anyway. And he says, you can use a, a diminished version of that cadence, and then he gives this cadence with a diminished bass. Mm. And then when I studied uh, the scores by Corelli, I found many situations in which the upper voices are always doing the same things, but you can find different version, versions of the bass. I will give you some examples, maybe. Okay. My right hand is always playing the same things. It's always playing this. Yeah, and if we do the doppia, we only put one bass note uh, below, uh, like a pedal point. But right. instead of this one bass note, we also can play, and the right hand does the same thing. Or, more amazing, two seventh chords after each other. Or, with a, a leading note to the dominant. And now comes the specific French version of that. <laughs> you started up, uh, Professor, oh, sorry, go ahead. You had one, you had another example. I know this, this, our first chord was the chord with the cancer <laughs> Right, right. Now you said that there are some things that Basso Continuo cannot explain. And so how, so is that because the figures there don't make sense in that regard? The figures always make sense, and we need the basso continuo to identify exactly the chords. Okay. This is uh, this is the, the the big advantage of basso continuo. Okay. You can always identify precisely the chord without any discussion. Uh, but you cannot see directly the families. You cannot see that mm. all those bass progressions I played before have the same upper voices. Right. The same as if you have a chain of dissonances in the right hand or in violins or what else, uh, you know, you can put a many, many different sequences below that. If you only read the basso continuo, you will, uh, maybe if you have uh, many experience, you can, you can know that, ah, here the upper voices will do a chain of dissonances. Right, right. But you need this experience. You right. cannot see it directly in the basso continuo. So you're saying that you can't, explicitly uh, know the that chain just by looking at the figures you, or you can if you there's a lot of experience if you have the experience to determine from the progression is ah this is a, this is what could happen okay that, that makes sense that makes sense and and um so is that i have you in your research did you look specifically at the doppia for all of europe french german italian Yes. So, the, of course, the doppia is quite uh, old. Yeah? Uh, we can find uh, the cadenza doppia already in the late uh, 15th century in, in some frottola repertoire in Italy. It, it was so so uh, established that uh, Nicola Vicentino uh, called it in uh, in 1555 uh, uh, the cadenza all'antica, the old cadenza. <laughs> <laughs> who knew that this cadence will have a, a a big future. 
<laughs> yeah, he, no one could have predicted that, right? I mean, <laughs> yes, no one can predict that. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, there's there's so much I actually want to ask you that might not be related to your current most recent research. So, um, should we? Is there anything else about the Dopia that we left out? Anything that we didn't mention that we should mention about your most recent research? Uh, concerning the Dopia, or just uh, anything with the French Baroque, and uh, you wrote a number of interesting articles. Um, yeah, we can we can just mention any any of those. Yeah, so uh, I recently I published uh, this one article uh, in which I want to, to just demonstrate some of those specific French uh, schemata, and in another article I I try to explain how. Uh, uh, a composer like uh, Francois Couperin was using those uh, uh, tools to um, yeah, to show the difference between Italian and French style. And in this article, I, I was um, uh, talking about the two uh, Apotheos pieces. One is the Apotheos uh, de Corelli, and the other one, the Apotheos de, de Mully. Uh, and it's the most interesting uh, thing is that in the Apotheos de Lully, the two figures, Corelli and Lully, they meet each other and they talk with each other, and everyone uh, is talking in his language. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, Lully is, is, is talking in a French manner, and, and Corelli is talking in an Italian manner, and this is really uh, uh, amazing and, and uh, also very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's let's now dive into um, very. I'm very interested in music education, so this is this podcast is related to music education, and uh, I'm a fan of. Uh, there's a very good YouTube channel called En Blanc et Noir, and he's a German uh, t- person, uh, Michael Koch, and uh, he he's been very complimentary of your work, and he he. I was talking to him about the Satz model in Germany and music education in Germany. And is it correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps I don't maybe several years ago, Satz model was all the rage. You know, everyone was, oh, this is the future of music education. And yet it's still kind, not mainstream. It's kind of a niche. It's 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 ga- definitely gaining popularity. But what would you say is um how is the reception of Partimento and Thorough Bass and this resurgence now in the modern, in Germany now, you would say? What, what, what do you think about how it's being received and the future for Satz Model? I think uh, in, in, in the German-speaking countries, uh, it has become a, a kind of standard to, to work with uh, Satz Model and with Partimento. So oh, great. We, when we started with it, uh, this was in the 2004, 5, 6, uh, right. around those years. I remember very well a conference in which uh, Ludwig Holtmeyer presented the Neapolitan uh, Partimento tradition, and I was also doing a lecture about a, a, a similar topic. And in this conference, uh, 2006, it was completely new for uh, almost all of our audience. <laughs> right. Yeah, but then happened a, a certain yeah revolution, I think, in, in the German-speaking countries. And in the meantime, many colleagues are, uh, are using it, and it's it's without uh, uh, battles of uh, ideology. So if, if if we talk about Baroque music, of course, we have to use that. Yeah, this is a little bit. Let's compare it with jazz. Yeah, if you if you talk about jazz, of course you will use the typical uh, uh, terminology of jazz chords. You will not use counterpoint or, or basso continuo. I would love to. <laughs> the, same as, <laughs> the, same, the same as if you talk about Baroque music, yep. of course, we, you, should, you should use the adequate theory. Okay. And I, uh, I, I'm, I think that this has become a certain standard today. That's good. Oh, so it the has. The okay. Adequate theory. Um, I, when I interviewed Professor... Robert Yerdigan, I think it was the second one, or maybe the first interview. And that really shocked me because he said Roman numerals are for amateurs. He was very, you know, you know him, he's blunt. So <laughs> he would say, uh, he would say things like this. And and I interviewed you and we talked about Adolf Bernhard Marx and we talked about Gottfried Weber and we talked about these people. What is that the sort of thing he was referring to? Was he referring to these German intellectuals 
who pioneered these methods that have become very dominant. If, I mean, till today, I mean, if people want to talk about music theory, we're still talking about uh, Stufen theory. We're still talking about Roman numerals. And um, so I, I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion uh, about, about these figures? Is that, do, are they people that were at a certain time in history that because of their position, because of the rise of the university system, they, they became extremely prominent and less of the artisan, less, less of the kind of the working musician, the, that sort of person, less intellectual. And I'm not meaning in, a, in an academic sense, I'm talking about uh, yeah, less scientifically minded. Uh, that method started to become less emphasized. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe to say one thing before, I think it's for, uh, for pedagogy. Uh, we never should search one system with which we can explain everything. This is always you will have very big problems if you try to do that. <laughs> a lot of arguments. So you, have to, <laughs> you have to exactly you yeah. have to find the adequate, the apt theory right. for the music. That this is my opinion, and this may also means we have to try to understand the development of history. For example, we have to accept and to understand why people in the 17th century used more and more basso continuo, why it was so useful for them. We also have to accept and to understand why they still used basso continuo in the 18th and in the 19th century. Yeah, even the 19th. And, the hand, and even in the 20th. Yeah. Right, right. And on the other hand, we also have to understand why there was a certain crisis of Basso Contino in the 18th century. So let's look in Mozart. The, the lessons are uh, done by Mozart. We know that, it, well, I guess... Is that the, the lessons with uh, Thomas Atwood? With, with Atwood and another pupil. And my, I guess he, he did experiments in his lessons because otherwise it would have been too boring for him. <laughs> uh, but so with one pupil, he did... <laughs> he did Basso Contino, and with the other one, he did uh, um, a fundamental bass. Maybe just to try out how it feels. <laughs> ah, so you're saying that it could? He was experimenting, and it was not part of the curriculum. Not okay. I think in Mozart there was not a fixed curriculum. It was doing right. something what he, what he wanted to do with uh, a pupil. Uh, but we can observe this tendency everywhere. We can this uh, tendency towards uh, simplification. So, for example, Daube was publishing uh, in the middle of the 18th century a treatise with the title Generalbass in drei Accorden. So, uh, through bass with three chords only. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so you, they wanted to, because if you read uh, Carl Philip, you see, I don't know how many chords, more than 20 <laughs> chords. Yeah. And then the people said, for pedagogical reasons, this is too much. Yeah, let's reduce. Okay. <laughs> If you read Rameau, you have two chords, yeah. third position and seventh. <laughs> if you read Bau W, you have three. So there was a certain competition. Yep. Who has <laughs> the minimum on chords? Right, right. Uh, so what about function theory then? So uh, that's a, so everyone is very interested in, in this topic. It, it is a hot topic. And so I, I, from what I understand, Martini, Padre Martini, and CPE Bach appeared hostile. To, to kind of this fundamental base thing. Um, and yet we also have, as you mentioned, Mozart experimenting with it. So yeah, a very famous musician. A Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg in his theory of harmony, I, I believe he approaches it in a Viennese way, right? In a kind of way that yeah. does have inversions and as very much a part of the system. So how do we make sense of that? And uh, because they occupy similar timeframes, maybe not Schoenberg, but still the Viennese system. They occupy, so different pedagogies, but occupying the same time. So it's not so much, uh, and do they compose differently certain people, perhaps the Simon Sector uh, or, or, you know, that, that sort of the, the Viennese style? Because um, they, they thought of fundamental base, I guess. Uh, yes, there's a, a certain tradition uh, with Simon Sector as a central figure. Uh, of the Viennese uh, fundamental birds tra- tradition, and we all know the influence on Bruckner, for example. Yeah. Mm, studied with, with him. And uh, because you mentioned uh, before Hugo Riemann, uh, right, this was yeah. a completely different figure. And we have to distinguish very well between okay. Sechter and the uh, Viennese fundamental birds tradition. Because most people just Hugo think Riemann. it's they think it's all the same, right? <laughs> with well, <laughs> it's, it's, 
it's a, it's a, 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 a big gap between both. Okay. Because Hugo Riemann was, was born later. And we should never forget, uh, here, I've, uh, I've looked, uh, Riemann uh, was born in, in 1849. Okay. So this was a generation. He could have been a, a child of Richard Wagner <laughs> 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 from his, uh, his birthday. And so his theory is in reaction on the crisis of tonality, of romantic harmony. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, yeah, uh, Riemann was an historian, a quite good historian. He, he, he wrote one of the first history of music theory books. Right. Uh, yeah, and he had some very crazy ideas. So, uh, I, for me, like what? Like what? Uh, what are some ideas that he put put forward that were a bit um, forward thinking or crazy? Yeah, the idea of dualism. I see. This, this was not his own idea. He has taken, uh, as far as I know. Uh, this idea from Karl Friedrich Weizmann, a quite interesting theorist before, not so much known. And also, uh, already Weizmann has started the theory saying that uh, minor is uh, the world of major, but uh, <laughs> on the on the head. <laughs> yes, yes. We're seeing that with negative <laughs> harmony now. <laughs> yes, negative harmony. And then uh, Riemann was obviously fond of this idea and he yeah. tried to explain seriously everything in minor in a complete different way. Yeah. So in minor, uh, the root of the code is not one, but it's five. And then everything, it's 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 completely the opposite. Yeah. It's, if you really want to do this in analysis, you will get a headache <laughs> after five minutes. <laughs> But he did, and he, he, he believed absolutely in this new method, and yeah. he believed that this is the, the truth. Yeah, a very intelligent person. But um, th now that's the thing, when you're teaching that as a pedagogy, um, how practical is that when you go very theoretical? Did, did Actually, that's a good question, which is, were there composers that he taught that really used this in practically? Yeah, uh, uh, if you if you look into the dev development of uh, Riemann's uh, functional theory in the yeah. 20th century, you can observe that very soon uh, the people tried to simplify Riemann's theory because it was too complicated for the practice. <laughs> right, right, right. I uh, there was and a there is now just this this a real pseudo Riemann theory, uh, which is simplified and and used. Uh, in many universities today, but it has not so much to do with the original ideas by Riemann. So for me, Riemann is only interesting if you study what he himself has said, and if you accept his crazy ideas, then it, it, it's a, a, a funny intellectual game. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, now there's also one more, um, Heinrich Schenker, of course. Now I want to talk about more his writing, his music. Um, and I liked what Ludwig, uh, Professor Ludwig Holtmeyer said, which was he was a very historically informed musician. Um, now, I, and but of course he's shooting. He's a, this this composer made this mistake. That composer made this mistake, uh, which is a very, quite a character. Um, but he was quite historically reformed. But pr what Professor Holtmeyer said was that he did not have many sources. Um, which is an interesting point, which I thought was was quite interesting. So what about Heinrich Schenker? Because he obviously was very much into uh, counterpoint and, and, and figured bass, but, and yet he also evolved. He felt that it wasn't, it could not, there were some limitations that you needed some kind of large harmonic idea as well. Um, so wh what do we make of Schenker as well? Yeah, maybe to start, uh, with Schenker is, um, if you look at um, into to some uh, modern uh, colleagues who well, are today fighting for historically informed theory, some of them they come from Schenker. Yeah. So let's look at uh, Giorgio Sanguinetti. <clears throat> yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, published some Schenkerian articles before he started his um, yes. Uh, uh, his research about Partimenti. And I think this is, uh, it, it fits a little bit because some basic ideas of Schenker are very basic. Yeah. So the idea of having a skeleton, which yeah. will be diminished, of working with the uh, thorough base. So, so Schenker did that, mm -hmm. of really looking uh, at the outer voices, looking at the bass voice yeah. itself. So these ideas, you can really, uh, they can lead 
you to the yeah. historically informed uh, theory. And the question, what would uh, Schenker had have done if he uh, had more the, 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 the sources? Yeah. Oh, hmm. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very strong opinions. Now, um, let me dive over to ear training methods. And um, uh, I want to just get your take on what do you think of hexachordal 18th century uh, Italian solfeggio we know the new book by Professor uh, Nicholas Baraguanath, which talks about this, where for my listeners, that's not, they, they don't have that seventh degree. They have two interlocking six note scales, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, and then on the fifth degree, do, re, mi, fa, so, la. And uh, do you find that has, is that interesting in your research? Does that, do, 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 is there anything to that with regard to harmony and counterpoint, especially how they composed? Yeah, the, the theory and the practice for, of somatization is was so important in music education coming from the Middle Ages until the 18th century and later that also this is a fact we have to accept. So it would be absolutely stupid to say uh, uh, somatization is unimportant. Uh, this cannot be because everyone uses it. Yes. Uh, so we have to accept this. and and But on the other hand, we also have to, to, to see that they have used... Um, mostly somatization for basic education. So it was the way how children learn the music. Yeah. And because they learned it as children, they also used it <laughs> later. For us today, it's uh, difficult to reconstruct this effect because most right. of us learn it as adults and not <laughs> as children. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, we still wanted to also ask you about the German pedagogy and uh, in, and, and it's also just a personal question for you. Uh, when you discovered Partimento and this uh, this whole new Satz model, um, how did you did you have a different perspective on looking at someone like Johann Sebastian Bach? Um, what was the change in the academia? Did, uh, do, are people looking at Bach differently, or or are there is, is there was he always been looked at in a basso continuo way? Yeah. I, so I agree that for a long time, the people um, have completely neglected the fact that Bach was living in a time where Basso Continuo was um, the most important tool for composers. There are some exceptions, uh, like uh, Walter Heimann, who published in the 1970s a book about the, the, the choral in Bach yep. and um, the relation with uh, the base. But in, in this time, in the 1970s, um, Nobody was interested in this kind of research. Well, it's interesting, yeah. So we, we have to wait until today. And I know that also Derek Remesh was here. Yes, yes. Uh, in this show, and, and he has done a, a fantastic research about the influence of uh, Basso Continuo on um, the uh, musical pedagogy by Bach. Can we talk about uh, classical improvisation as well? And I know that ger organists have always improvised. Or that's something that organists always have, have done. Um, but do we are we seeing it now for other instruments, piano, violin? Are people starting to look at classical music and not think of improvisation as a dirty word? They're <laughs> thinking of it as now, oh, now it's, it's, wow, it's really becoming more and more important to be as part of the identity of a classical musician. Uh, I hope so. So if you do uh, early music, uh, it's absolutely clear that you have to, uh, to, to, to be able to improvise with your instrument. And I hope that because we know it was also used in the 19th century, that this, this will become a part of music education more and more. Great. Um, a couple of fun questions. I just want to get your opinion. I'm going to mention a composer and you can just react how you want to react. So uh, is, is that okay? So I, I want to mention let's the German. <laughs> let's, let's try it out. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't, that's okay. So the first one is Handel. I know you've, you've worked on Handel, researched him. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think about Handel? Maybe music education, significance, music wise, anything that comes to mind? Well, uh, Beethoven said it was the greatest composer of all times. <laughs> what should I add? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of his bases as exercises for partimenti or just for, for learning music? 
is, uh, you know, I have done an edition of the basses yes. together with uh, Felix Tiergarten and Ludwig Holtmeier. And I love the basses and the exercises by Handel. Handel must have been a, a, a fantastic teacher because in his exercises, you find so many informations and they work so well. So it can. <laughs> oh, we should check that out. I'll put the link in the description for that. And how about um, Telemann? Uh, Telemann, yeah. Wow, wow, Telemann composed uh, so many music, it's difficult to get an overview. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, um, what do you make of the, uh, well, let's talk about Bach. And, and I want to talk what, particularly for music students. Um, like, for instance, some people have said that Bach is not a usual Baroque musician, or he's not, he's a bit unusual because his compositions are like overkill. There's just so much happening. It's it's amazing, uh, but maybe it's 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 not to say it's bad, but maybe it's not normal in the sense that it's unusual in that it's got so much happening and is wonderful. Um, but do, 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 what do you think of him didactically? His, in, his inventions, his symphonias, the the well tempered clavier. Uh, people have always played Bach, but maybe from the perspective of a Partimento student. Yeah. Uh, so first, I would agree that Bach's music is not normal because it's it's so <laughs> so great. Uh, yeah. And if you want to 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 learn how Baroque music works, you should first study uh, no Bach. <laughs> and if you know it very well, then you can study Bach again. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, Bach had a great influence on a certain uh, German school because the musicians later. All of them, they studied uh, his pieces. So this is also a part of the history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, how about, um, uh, what about, can you mention a composer that was, is very important to you, that you think is very useful and for Partimento? We spoke, spoke a lot about the Germans, but there, are there any Italians that for you have significance? At which time? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Maybe the 18th century, 18th century. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, of course, we have to look to the prominent name. So why not uh, talking about Vivaldi? Yep. So I think uh, we can learn a lot of things. And uh, uh, Vivaldi's uh, influence on the development, especially of instrumental music, uh, is, uh, is very big. And he's yeah. different, quite a lot different from Corelli, right? Yes, it's, so of course he knew Corelli very well, uh, uh, but he wanted to, to to establish a new style of instrumental music, much more virtuosic and, and more effects with the orchestra. And right. if you look at into the scores of his concerts, you can see that he ah, he's, he's so fle flexible in how, what he does with the orchestra. Sometimes two voices, sometimes three, four, five. Right. Always something new happens, so it's really more. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, it was a, a very new music in his time. What do you think of um, the Bol Bolognese tradition of Partimento? There's obviously the Naples tradition is very famous, but are you familiar with yeah. Mate, Padre Martini, and that tradition? Um, I, I think this tradition is very helpful if you want to study or want to concentrate on some counterpoint uh, uh, aspects. Uh, so let's take an example. If we if we take uh, Matei and Stanislaw Matei and his uh, own realizations for a string quartet of his right, bases, right. this is really useful. Right. Okay. Um, wonderful. I, I and I think we're coming to the end of it. But uh, oh, it's such it's, it's, it's really been wonderful talking to you, Professor Menke. Can you talk about how you would advise someone to learn Partimento? You mean how to start learning or which sources we should... Uh, right, or basso continuo. Um, what's your advice for someone learning the, uh, the yeah, the, I guess the common practice music. So basso continuo slash partimento slash counterpoint, because they, they seem to be all connected in some way. Yeah, I think there. It's a little bit like the the the, the, the picture. All ways are leading to Rome. So <laughs> <laughs> I could recommend many things. I could recommend uh, you can do the handle exercises. Yeah. Of course, officially they are no partimenti, 
but basically they work in a similar way. You will learn the schemata if you play the basses. You will learn uh, how to do an, uh, um, um, a fugue with uh, Passo Contino, and you also will learn how to compose uh, a little movement or a sweet movement even with his exercises. This is one way leading to Rome. Yep. <laughs> and we have all, all the Italian and Neapolitan ways leading to Rome, uh, where we have this, in the meantime, this fantastic research by all the colleagues who were talking here in the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so if you, if you read the, the famous books by, by uh, Sanguinetti and Peter van Tour, so you will find so many hints for, for sources you can study. Um, uh, maybe one thing we should not forget that, that um, the influence and the importance of uh, the Patimento tradition takes place in uh, the 18th century and had an influence on the Romantic composers. Yes. So what we, we should not think Patimento, this is Baroque music. Yes. The Patimento and the influence of Patimento is a little bit later. Right. And in the Baroque time, because for me, Baroque time is is 17th century and a little bit of the 18th century. In the Baroque time, we have the development yeah. of the Batimento tradition. We, and this, it sets a kind of, at the end of this development, uh, as an heritage for the next generation. We talked to also, um, we discussed a little bit before the show about the limitations, right, of thorough bass. I, I want to talk about that because that's an important thing to talk about. It's very easy to say this is the get the greatest thing of all time, <laughs> but maybe can we can we talk about the limitations so people understand? Um, it's good to have um, a clear idea of of what you will get and what you cannot really reach for if you go through this way. So I think this is with every tool you have to know uh, for what can I use the tool and for what not. Yes. Let's take the rule of the octave. It gives us an information about uh, the typical harmonies, about uh, the, the basic harmonies. And what you can produce with the rule of the octave is a kind of uh, a pizza margarita. Yeah? So with uh, <laughs> and tomatoes and, and mozzarella, it works always, but uh, there's nothing special into it. Yeah. And if you want to have a more interesting pizza, <clears throat> you have to uh, use more things. Yeah. For example, if you want to have a Corelli pizza, you have to do the beginning in this way. And not, yeah, because for Corelli it's typical to use three voices, so it's very typical to start with contrary motion in the fifth and so on. So you have to, yeah, you have to do counterpoint. You always have to combine counterpoint and basso continuo and then the music. And uh, what's uh, the best way to learn counterpoint? The best way to learn counterpoint. Yeah, of course, you have to do the um, first the easy thing, the note against note, or it's impossible. You have to accept that you only have three possibilities of motion. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know, you have to know uh, the intervals. You have to learn to, 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 to pay attention on the quality of intervals, because this is the foundation for every code later. You have to do the basic uh, exercises. Do you need a teacher? Is a teacher important? You need a, a certain textbook or a certain treatise for counterpoint. Um, or yeah, yeah, that's that's my second question: is can no. you can you even self teach yourself, or do you suggest you must get a teacher? No, uh, I think you have to have a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what it everyone depends. is saying on your psych psychological uh, uh, constitution. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everyone is saying you do need a teacher yeah. but most but we are as human beings uh, many things we are doing for other people uh, so a, a teacher is very helpful uh, and, but uh, then the counterpoint is, is a technique you have to do it's like a, learning an instrument you have to yeah. do it daily <clears throat> uh, if you only read a book it <laughs> doesn't help right. like and reading a book how, 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 how piano playing works Right, right. Um, wonderful. So now my next, I guess my final question is, wh what's your reaction to, oh, no, another question, uh, one more I want to squeeze in is, is basso continuo useful for music that's not classical music? So people would say, ah, pardimento, very good, very good, appropriate. We talked about appropriate tools. 
But yes. can someone who's learning Partimento or Basso Continuo write pop music? Would that be useful in music education? For pop music, yeah, I think it's not so far away because the, the, the harmonic language, uh, not of jazz, but of pop, of many popular music, yeah. uh, uh, is, is very close to late romantic harmonies very often. Yep. And um, some mistakes are done very often when, when, if people uh, neglect the, um, the importance of the bass line, for example. Yeah. So and when I do my lesson, sometimes I have guests uh, from our jazz institute. Yep. And they are always very inspired if they do counterpoint and, <laughs> and, and other methods. Yeah. Because then they, they get new ideas. <laughs> 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 so obviously it's helpful. <laughs> I, I found what was very interesting is that many of the composers, not all of them, but many of them for jazz standards were yeah. emigres from Europe who had a mm. classical training. And that could explain why there were so many unusual harmonies. And I, I think actually there are some famous film composers who went to Hollywood who were European trained classical. And even a jazz, I remember a jazz one. Um, his name escapes me, but he was in everything. Um, uh, but he was like a German counterpoint training musician. And there he is writing big band scores. So I, I don't think it's so far away. No, it's not so far away. So some, um, <laughs> some jazz standards, they have old, uh, uh, like a lamento bass, chromatic lamento bass or something right. else. Or if we talk about uh, music for, for movies, <clears throat> if you're... Uh, if we study this course by Ennio Morricone, they are full of Baroque standards. Right. <laughs> because he was a, a very well-educated person. Yeah. Yeah. And he knew all the, the great masters. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so and I, now the question that I wanted to ask to end of is, what do you see as the future for Partimento? And, and I use that as a big term. Partimento includes Basso yeah. Continuity, includes Counterpoint, this different way of thinking. Uh, what's the future like uh, in the next five years? Yeah, I hope that Basso Continuo will, <clears throat> will, will become a, a, a bigger role in music education everywhere. And I hope that the colleagues will understand that with Basso Continuo, also with doing lessons uh, more with the keyboard, you can connect better theory and practice for the students. Because our, uh, um, yeah, our danger very often in music theory is that we come into a kind of a, a vicious circle. So we, 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 we teach uh, music theory like, a, 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 like Latin grammar. And then for the musicians, they ask, uh, they wonder, what is the, 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 the relation with the practice I do? With, what, what is the, <laughs> the relation with the symphony I'm playing today? Yeah, and and uh, my experience was if we do more um, basso continuo, it's easier for them to bring it together, the practice and the theory, and so it uh, it it's, it will be good for for our subject. But we should not uh, be too dogmatic. Yeah, if we so, if we say, oh, now we are only doing that, and then all the people have to do it, and uh, all other things are evil. <laughs> <laughs> Then we come only to another, another hell. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, do do you can you do you have any personal anecdotes of you teaching students who? Because I still feel that this is very new to a lot of students. A lot of young students come to college, and when they learn theory, I know in for uh, um, Southeast Asia, ABRSM or Trinity, these are exam boards from the UK. Um, so they mm -hmm. often. I know some stories where people go to like the Schola Basiliensis and they say, I have never heard of this theory in my life. It's so different from when I was at home. You're, I've been learning a completely different system. And do you find personal anecdotes of students who are like that and like, ah, this is a very good system? Yeah, in, in, uh, in our school, Schola Cantorum, um, most of the students are quite familiar with Basso Continuo. Because yeah. they are playing Baroque instruments, Baroque music uh, since a long time. So in my experience, uh, the, the bigger thing was the counterpoint. So if the people uh, are learn 
or start to compose only with intervals. Right. And to, to accept what is a fourth, uh, a fourth is something very different to a fifth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, the names of the notes are the same, but the quality is the opposite. Yeah. So those experiences were, uh, for some students, are really uh, new. Uh, and then if we come to the, the chords and basso continuo, then ah, it becomes a little bit more familiar for them. Right, right. Uh, but this uh, is the perfect, for me, the perfect order, starting with counterpoint and then come uh, to, to a basso continuo. So it's, it's the way of, uh, the, of the history. Some people have asked me, is it too late for me? I'm an adult. Is it too late for me to learn partimento? And then another question is, I'm old. I'm, I didn't do this as a child. Is it too late for me to be a composer? No, it's never too late. It's just a, an, um, I think it, you don't have to forget completely what you want before. Uh, in a certain way, uh, through a bass is a new, very helpful uh, and more easy perspective on the same things. Right. So do you... my experience. I also, I also was not educated when I started with a bus, with uh, with uh, the rule of the octave and partimenti because it was not discovered in this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, great. I mean, w what an honor to speak with you, Professor Menke. The first time we have a video podcast. I, this was fun, wasn't it? It turned out okay, right? Yes, it, it, it was really amazing to do it, and especially to play also some examples of my, yeah. my organ here. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you, and I think the audience would love that. And please come back again. We need we, There's more things to talk about. Maybe we can, um, we can also... What I wanted to do is do some screen sharing and maybe have you react to some of the examples in your article. We can do that maybe the next time as I figure out this system. But um, please, uh, do you want to mention... Uh, the names of the articles for people to check out. By the way, if it's in German, it's very easy to just put the article in Google Translate. So even if you're not a German speaker, it's very easy to read these articles. I read the articles and they're very good. Yeah, I have many examples in the articles uh, and you can play and then some of the examples will explain themselves. Uh, so today we were talking about the article uh, Die Familie der Cadenza Doppia. And uh, I have to look for the precise um, title, Französische Satzmodelle des Concierge. And both articles are online. Great. We'll put... So, you can find on the website of the GMT, uh, GMT Half. The German I'll, put, speaking I'll put the links GMT. in the description. People and can check can it out. Put the links. Exactly. Wonderful. And do you want to mention anything coming up, Professor Menke? Any, anything upcoming that you want to just share with people? Our, at the moment, I'm working on a big project uh, because I'm working on a monography, including a biography of François Couperin. <laughs> wow. When is that coming out? I think such a book is a big project for many years. You know. <laughs> uh, when is that coming out? I hope in uh, in 23. Great, great. Wonderful. Well, <laughs> really, really excellent. And uh, thank you again. And it's always a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, thank you for sharing and doing what you do to promote uh, your research because it's really it's really people are um, uh, really benefiting from it. I know personally, I know from the En Blanc et Noir channel, and, and your work is mentioned. He mentions your work uh, to me and saying, "Yeah, he's Johannes Menke. He's really a very important scholar. So we should definitely be have him on as much as possible." So I, I think that's definitely the case. So thank you so much, Professor Menke. Let's uh, let's do this again soon. Okay. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Mm. See you later. Bye-bye. See you later. Goodbye.
Thank you.